possible. So we would show you how you could utilize a service like abacus.ai and then get to that stage quickly. And for that, we will present this whole demo using two use cases as I already mentioned, recommendations, and then finally forecasting. So before we reach to the demo stage, we should make sure that we understand the core of deep learning because as a deep learning first company, all our machine learning models are deep learning based. So that's why if you don't understand what actually is deep learning, then there is no point moving further. And as I can see, like most of you are from a very diverse uh, demographics and definitely you are also from a very, uh, from a very uh, varying levels of familiarity uh, with machine learning. Somebody is a data scientist at some company, somebody is just a student and a beginner. So with that, I'm assuming that I should start with something very basic and then move on gradually to something more advanced. Okay, so let's start with the very first thing. What is deep learning? So deep learning is a specific class of machine learning algorithms and machine learning is itself a subset of artificial intelligence. So you're actually in a subset of a subset. When we talk about deep learning, it's like a subset of machine learning, which as I said further, is a subset of artificial intelligence. So, so with that, let me try to, uh, like to try to build an intuition on what actually deep learning means. So deep learning is nothing but majorly deep neural, uh, deep neural networks. And what deep neural network does is they learn representations like human beings. We learn representations internally, right? Like uh, what's the temperature right now? What's the weather? We have like an internal representation of that weather. Or when we see something, maybe a car or dog or whatever, there's an internal rep representation which, which we make of that. Like if you see an apple, you can like visualize an apple, right? That like sort of an internal representation that you make. And similarly in your brain, there are some chemical and uh, neurological representations that are being formed that you might not be consciously aware of. So similarly, artificial neural networks, what they do is depending upon the data modality, maybe audio, maybe vision, maybe sound, uh, or maybe like language, depending upon that, or maybe something a, as simple as a tabular data that we use a lot in the industry, these neural networks, they, they learn representations. So internally, they create representations based on these data modalities, and then they utilize these representations in order to give you some intelligent results. So we will first see, now that we understand what deep learning does, what neural networks are meant for, I think the next step would be to go a little deeper and see how actually they do it, do that. Oh, I would wanna uh, bring into your attention personalized recommendation use case, because that's what we are gonna use today for, uh, for the demo. So under this, it's one of the solutions that abacus.ai provides. And under this solution, we are gonna use a movie lens data set. And then we will predict what are the movies that somebody might be interested into. So you're most welcome to like bring in your data sets. For example, you might be very fond of movies and you might have collected a set of movies that you like. So you might create your own data set using your specific uh, uh, inclinations. And then you can train a model uh, on the same movie lens broader data sets so that you would be able to recommend movies for yourself. So you can, you can like really play with the system and do a lot with it. It's like the limit is your creativity and your imagination, nothing else. So today we are gonna do something like that. We will take the movie lens data set and we will see how it produces recommendations based on the history data for some users. And yeah, as I said, the focus of this workshop is to help you familiarize with the deep learning concepts and then make you use them for making the most out of your data. So for that, we will not waste time in like delving deeper into the algorithms uh, or a lot of data munging or the backend engineering that goes along with all these uh, processes, but we will actually be more focused on our machine learning or deep learning recipe and how to quickly get the results that we want from the data set that we are interested into. So with that, let me 
jump to the part where we dive a little deeper and learn the deep learning concepts. So now that you know what neural network does, it basically makes representations based on the data that you give it. Let's dive deeper into how they do that, how they're able to do that. So these are, so this slide is quite heavy and I always keep it in my presentation because, because I wanna signify that even if somebody knows a little bit about all these terminologies, then they would be able to use abacus.ai or some advanced service like that to get the most, to get the most of their data sets or the most from their data sets. So with that, let me introduce a few of these right here, right away. Uh, so your data is primarily split it into three subsets, training set, validation set, and then test set. Training set is where uh, you train your model. So there's a deep neural network, and then you use the data to make, to, to create, to make the network learn those representations. So this is that subset of data that helps it do so. And validation set, so you would know that there are some hyperparameters associated with a deep neural network, and those are tuned during validation set, uh, using validation set. And then finally, we have a test set because we need to see how well our neural network is trained. So for that, we keep aside a separate unit of the original data set called test set so that we can finally evaluate, get an unbiased evaluation of the trained model, the trained deep neural network. So let's talk a bit about those parameters that we, uh, that we tweak on this validation set. So one of, the, one of those parameters is the learning rate. Uh, so there's a separate slide that I've kept, so I'll make it more clear in that slide. But here, let's quickly uh, understand this diagram because it's a great analogy for understanding the core of, of how neural networks learn those representations that I was talking about. So look at this cliff. So what happens is you are on top of the cliff or maybe at the bottom of the cliff and you wanna reach the top. So what happens is you, you would like try to gauge what way should I go in order to reach the bottom, right? So for that, you would like place your foot in front and then see what is the steepest point. And then that's how you would decide step-by-step step, the steepest, steepest, steepest. And then following this trail, you would reach the lowest, one, the lowest point. So that's, that's the same principle that neural networks apply. There's something called gradient descent, which will, which will show them the steepest descent point at each point. So they start with something random, like entirely random, like, like there are, so th there are, there's information which is very random in the beginning. And then uh, at every such random point, there's a descent that happens, which is calculated by, by, by utilizing the fact that the gradient always points towards the steepest direction. So that's how doing this gradient descent on and on again and again, the fin finally the neural network learns the right representation. So this was a very broad explanation of what might be the underlying principle on which these neural networks learn. But we will dive a little bit deeper in order to understand and make it more clear in the subsequent slides. AutoML. So you might have heard a lot about AutoML. It's like very, uh, very prominent and a lot of papers are coming uh, these days on it. It's like the new electricity, I would rather say. So AutoML, uh, like at a very abstract level, I would say AutoML is like making another neural network learn uh, how to tweak those hyperparameters that we have just talked about. So those hyperparameters needs tweaking, like what should be the learning rate, right? Or what should be the dropout? So that needs to be learned. So an another neural network can help that learn. So that's AutoML, like instead of a human trying to tweak or human interrupting in order to get the best hyperparameter, a neural network with itself formulate a set of hyperparameters that would best train another neural network. So let me introduce this dropout as well, because I've been using this uh, term hyperparameter and I have not explained many hyperparameters. So dropout is one of those hyperparameters. Like, uh, so what happens in dropout is there are neurons inside these neural networks and these neurons uh, have a number inside, right? And those are the numbers that actually uh, uh, together form that representation that I was talking about. So we have to get to the right number at, at each neuron. For that, we do all this gradient descent. And for dropout, what happens is, 
so that this neurons, so these neurons, so the so you should understand this fact first that the whole the whole idea of deep learning or training a deep neural network is to to make the network learn something which is which is generalizable or some pattern which is which is not fixed to a particular data that you give it. So if you give it a fixed data and then it learns the trends in that data or the underlying patterns in that data, then again, someday your data might change and you might want, uh, give it some other data and then it would not be able to generalize to that other data. So that's what we technically call as overfitting. That means that the network is just learning with respect to a specific small uh, piece of data or maybe that piece might be big, but still. So that's what not we ideally want. We want it to learn generalizable representations. We don't want it to like learn one specific set of movies or one genre so that we can get recommendations for only that movies, right? We want it to learn like generalizable representations so that it can produce recommendations for a variety of users on a variety of different kinds of genres of movies, right? So for that, what we do is something called dropout. So what we do is like drop randomly few neurons, and then the network learns to adapt based on those. Uh, yeah, I'll answer your questions yep, later, as I said in Q and A. So uh, randomly, these neurons are dropped, and that's that helps the neural network to generalize better. So in short, that is the dropout. You randomly drop neurons and their connections, and that's how you get better generalizability on the data. And this is ensemble averaging. That means you might have heard like three are better than one, right? <laughs> Something like that. So you train three networks and then together they give you better representations when the results are averaged. So that's what happens here. You train different networks and then you ensemble them to get the result. So let's, with that, now you have a basic idea, a high level idea of a lot of hyperparameters and terminologies associated with deep neural networks. Let's jump to a little more depth. Let's like dive a little deeper and, and try to understand uh, what exactly happens due to which the representations that the neural network generates are, are so, so optimal. So what happens inside a neural network is something like this. So it's a simple function, x equals to y square. And as you already might have studied in your high school level math, there is a parabola that corresponds to this equation. So what happens is these blue are the original parabola uh, points corresponding to these, this equation that we have. And then these are the subsequent points that are generated, that are generated by the neural network or learned by the neural network. And as you can see how close they are. So neural network is nothing but basically a function approximator. So what it does is it approximates a function that closely resembles the original function. So what we do is we design a simple neural network with some neurons, let's say 10 neurons. And then we have a non-activation function, which means ReLU. So you need not really understand these activations and non-linear functions, but if you wanna dig deeper, uh, you can, there, there's a lot of resources. So if you're interested, you can really study what are activation functions, what are, what is the depth and breadth, how many neurons you should have in a layer and stuff like that. But for this, uh, for the purpose of today's demo, we actually don't need to dive that deeper. So I won't go much into that. Okay, so coming back to the topic, what happens is the neural network tries to randomly predict some points. And then what we do is create a mathematical equation which is called technically a loss function or an error function. And with that, we calculate what is the error in the prediction with respect to the actual point. It might be a distance error, let's say the actual point minus the, the predicted point. So that might be the error, right? So if you try minimizing that loss, you would eventually get to the real points, right? So that is the idea here, making a loss function and then minimizing that loss function. And that, that gradient descent that I explained, that helps in this process that minimizes this loss. Okay, so this is the gradient descent that I was explaining earlier using that slope uh, analogy. So let's suppose there's a function JW based on this W parameter. So, and then this function looks like this. So there will be a 
global minimum value for this function. And that's what ideally we want to get to. So what we do is randomly, let's say we started with this, the initial weight. And as I said, the descent, uh, the, the derivative of this point will be the steepest descent. So calculating derivative and then subtracting that derivative, this initial value will bring us close to the global minimum, right? So we keep doing this. But the problem that occurs is how much of that value should we subtract? Because if we keep subtracting the descent, then we might really come like at a point which is very, which is not optimal, which is not like pointing here, but actually far from here. So if we don't control this subtracted value here, this value, then we might end up going like here and then here, 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 and really like crazy haywire instead of like pointing here. So we might want to regulate the amount of descent. For that, there's something like learning rate, this alpha. So what this helps in is to manage that descent. So the amount of descent is managed by this alpha, and that's how we gradually descend to this global minimum. So at every, so think of the whole neural network as doing this. So this is a simple one function. Uh, this is a simple function based on one parameter. So the, the, the whole neural network is actually composed of a lot of such parameters and a very a big like loss function that it's comprised of all those parameters. And then jointly, we kind of minimize that whole, uh, the, 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 the big uh, mathematical equation that might be formed respect to the, with, uh, in, in correspondence to the neural network that you might have. So, so that's what is basically the backbone of the neural network. You basically do gradient descent by setting a learning rate, and then you come to the right representation. And that's how you finally get the good uh, intelligent predictions that you are trying to get from your data. So there are some other hyperparameters that I would like to introduce. One is this batch size. So how many how many, so that you might have a big data set with like millions of rows. So how many rows at one point of time would you wanna give to that neural network for, for it to, to learn the right representations, right? So that is what is called batch size. So batch size uh, is something that it needs to be regulated because if you have like a large batch size, then you would have a lot of compute required in order to, in order to, to train the right, to, in order to train the neural network. But on the other side, the accuracy of this de descent will be more because now you have more context. On the other side, if you have a fewer training examples, then your accuracy would be less, but your result would be faster to compute. So there's a trade-off in these two. So that's why there are a lot of there, there's a lot there's a lot that goes into how to get to the batch size. But yeah, you should at least know like there's something like batch size and what it means in a neural network. Data splitting already introduced what is training set, what is, what is validation set, and what is test set. So one, uh, one thing I would like to add here is now you know what are these hyperparameters like learning rate, batch size. Now you're in a better position to understand this validation set. So what validation set is, it, uh, does is it kind of helps in tweaking these hyperparameters and setting the right values. So you have one part of the data where you are training the neural network, which you are using for training the neural network. And then you have another part of the data set, which is validation set, and you use it to tweak those hyperparameters. And then you use this configuration of training set, training the network on training set, and then validating those hyperparameters on validation set. And then you keep repeating it on various such folds of validation and training sets in order to get the right hyperparameters, which you might already know as cross validation. So this all happens within the system automatically. Like it divides, it splits your data set that you upload into all these sets. It gives you a result on the test set, which the network has never seen during training. And then it tweaks the hyperparameters internally on a validation set. Okay, now at the very end, before we start the demo, uh, we should get the hang of what, um, what it takes to evaluate the model, the, the trained deep neural network. So on our test set, we would be evaluating the, the network as we already discussed, but these will be the metrics that will be useful for evaluating it. NDCG map, MRR, personalization at 10 coverage. So they evaluate the network, uh, the recommender system uh, on, a, on a variety of parameters or on a variety of uh, uh, different scales. 
or dimensions to be more precise, sorry. So let's, with this, let's start with the demo because during the demo, when we'll, when we'll get to the screen, we'll be able to use the internal help texts within the product that I've written to be able to make sense of all these metrics and all these numbers. And there it would make more sense to introduce and get into the details of what these uh, accuracy measures stand for, okay? So with this, let's start with our demo. Uh, hey, Ankit, uh, yeah. before you get into the demo, uh, would you mind to uh, look at some of the questions? I see quite a lot of questions in the chat and the Q&A. Sure, sure. Yeah, let's have a look. I'm typing answers now also. Sorry, Yuri, what? Yeah, I'm also typing answers now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's probably easier to just uh, answer it uh, using the voice instead of uh, type the questions, type the answers. Okay, okay. cool. So let me get to the chat and see. So let me start from the bottom. So using a cyclic learning rate or momentum-based optimizer in many ways automatically chooses a learning rate. What is this algorithm is available in the recyclic? So are you talking about the recyclic, like uh, the, the recyclic start algorithm or are you talking about something else? So from what I understand, Cyclic learning rate and momentum-based optimizers automatically chooses learning rate. So it's not okay. So the so it's not the op, the, the optimizer that chooses a learning rate. It's it's basically tweaked on a validation set, as I said. Like you take different brackets of learning rate and then you try to see if your network is converging, or if there are a variety of methods. Like you have a loss function versus uh, the, uh, the the loss function graph. So you have like, you, you take the loss and then you take a learning rate and then you see, you map the graph of the learning rate versus loss and then you tweak and you then you get to the, uh, then you see how far with respect to the loss, your network is converging. And then at some point you stop where it starts to go up the loss again. So at that point, you know that your true learning rate li uh, lies. So at, that's how you, that's like, that might be one of the ways to, to, to uh, get to the right learning rate. But cyclic restarts, it's an entirely different process. So what cyclic restarts does is, so let's say your network is trained to a level. Now what you do is like, like you might have seen those cost and sign curves, right? So like a cost curve, you again, you again try to increase the learning rate. And then you gradually, according to that sign function, you gradually decrease it. Uh, and then you, you gradually again, like, like following the sign function, you gradually decrease it to, in order for the network to be able to converge more than previously. So you again and again do it, and that's what is called cyclic restarts. Okay, let's see. So yeah, the, the question is also like what recommendation uh, algorithms we're using, and I, I guess the, the, the main one we're using are an answer actually for that. But we will also yeah. have uh, uh, some other more, more traditional methods. Uh, yeah, so internally we have like, uh, so there's a lot that goes on with uh, generating these recommendations. We have our RNN, but that depends on your data set, whether, whether internally we would use a CNN or an RNN. And then after that, so what happens is there's a featureization that happens using the CNN or the RNN. And then those features are fed to the, uh, to the straight feed forward neural network. And then the recommendations are generated. So, so, it's like not pretty, it's not that straightforward. Depends, depending upon how easy your data is as, uh, as far as featureization con uh, is concerned or depending upon like whether you have joint tables in your data where it would be more necessary to use an RNN. It, it depends like the, al the algorithm inside changes according to your data. No, I'm not talking about uh, the cyclic restarts or Rexes. I'm talking about the algorithm that is internally present for generating the recommendations. I'm not sure what you mean by Rexis. Is it cyclic restart or something else? Recommendation system. Oh, recommendation system. Yeah, CNN for recommendation system, yes. We use a lot of convolutional layers in the very beginning. Uh, and then, uh, or sometimes an RNN, yeah. So I don't know whether you're familiar with those uh, papers with a lot of 
papers that came in the last two years. And a lot of them have like uh, showed that how training an RNN is more costlier computation wise as compared to training a CNN, but you get the same results using the CNN as you get with an RNN. So with a uh, limited computation cost, sometimes you can even get a better result as compared to the traditional RNN. So you might wanna go and look into those, uh, yeah, that will bring a lot of clarity into how CNNs are used in, as an alternative. Uh, okay, then let's see. Yeah, also there is like this question about reinforcement learning. Yeah, currently we're, we're, we're not using reinforcement learning in our product but we, we are evaluating uh, potential applications. And we, we do actually have it in, in our research. Like if you look at our papers, uh, uh, this is something that that's, uh, we're actively looking into. Yeah. So when I said, yeah. Uh, also, yeah, so we're, um, yeah, there were a lot of questions about like how to find optimal hyperparameters and like learning rate. So we basically at the backbone in many of our use cases, uh, as Ankit was talking about, we have uh, some version of AutoML. So the our AutoML system is actually actively trying to look into also different uh, optimization algorithms and uh, different uh, and, and, and different basically hyperparameters for, for this optimization algorithms, including uh, learning rate and like di different schedules for learning rate. And then, uh, so we evaluate basically a lot of candidates. And then in the end of the day, using validation set, we try to pick one that makes uh, the, the best sense. Yeah. And I already discussed about that graph that you can utilize, but that's something that we internally don't do because we have more sophisticated methods, but that's one of the simple methods where you can check the loss versus your learning rate, specifically for this hyperparameter learning rate I was talking. And yeah, uh, there are different methods for different learning rates like dropout rate. There's AutoML that you can use for dropout. As I said, uh, it will try different sets of uh, hyperparameter, like different values of dropouts, and then it will see what kind of results it produce, and then based on that, it will uh, select the best ones, the top, the top ones. Yeah, and then there's something like uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the grid search and random search. So those are other techniques that are used to that are used to do well, hyperparameter are, tuning. Yeah, this this ones are very very simple to implement actually, and. Uh, in, in, in many cases, surprisingly, uh, random search works. Uh, well, with some tweaks, works uh, uh, works as good as uh, some something more complicated. Like, uh, but basically, usually it's used as as a, as a baseline in, in comparing different uh, AutoML optimization algorithms. Uh, but comparing, like, also the cost of uh, actually running the optimization algorithm, random search is like very simple. We just generate random candidates and then evaluate them. So common hyperparameters we have already seen, like dropout rate, bat size, learning rate. So uh, there, 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 there is also, uh, yeah, there are a couple of questions regarding how to connect to AWS or other cloud. Uh, yeah, we do have connectors. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if An Ankit actually knows a little bit more about them, uh, but what, what we'll show you actually, even in our current demo is that you can just uh, point, uh, we, we, we will be basically, as, as, a, as a simple example, we will be just using a uh, data set that are already like uh, uploaded to AWS. Yeah, during the demo, we will, uh, we will use an, our own internal AWS bucket to bring in the data set into the Abacus.ai platform. And then that's what we will utilize to train the deep learning based model. Yeah, I'll show you how to do that shortly. So we, we have like, yeah, a, lo a lot of uh, more like mod modeling related questions. I'm, I'm not sure if we should need to answer them right now or maybe, maybe later after we- Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll continue typing and maybe I'm get, yeah. Uh, okay, so I'll continue with the demo. And then at the end, we could, we could definitely have more time in order to answer all these questions that people might have. 
Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. So uh, just a quick reminder. So folks, please post the questions in the Q&A. Uh, I see too many uh, text messages in the chat. It's really hard to, uh, to track. Um, and please, you know, uh, the, uh, post your questions in the Q&A. It's much easier to manage and track. Uh, and also, if you prefer to speak to ask questions, uh, raise your hand. Uh, both Ankit and the jury, uh, they can unmute you to at the, you know, some uh, convenient times uh, so you can speak to uh, ask questions. So, um, yeah, so the chat is, I see too many messages in the chat. It's really hard to, 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 to check. Okay. Uh, yeah, please go ahead, Ankit. Okay. So this is the link for the Collab notebook that you will be using for this demo and even for the URI's demo later. So kindly open this, please, so that we could start with the demo. So these are the three recommendation data sets that I was talking about. We'll use, so this is the address, the bucket URI. So this corresponds to an AWS bucket internal to our system. And that's what you'll be utilizing to pull the data from. So we have user movie ratings, which comes from he here. We have user attributes, we have movie attributes. So with this, let's start with the signup process so that we can start using Abacus.ai platform to train our One get you disappeared. Sorry, technical difficulty, I guess. Uh, is Ankit speaking? Yeah. I cannot hear him anymore. Okay, am I back? Oh, okay, yeah, you're back. Okay, great. Not sure what exactly happened. Maybe some glitch in the network. Okay, so you can again see my screen, right? My screen is visible to everybody? Uh, yes. Okay, so let's first start up start by signing up. So you would have to just click here. For me, it's, since I'm logged into my abacus.ai account, it won't work. So I'm gonna open a new incognito and then paste the link there. So this is what you will see after you click on that link to sign up. Okay. Yeah, let me increase the font size. Oh, it's not. Okay. So here's the sign up link. You just need to click on it. And this is what you will see. You will come to this URL. Now type in your name, your email address, and some password with minimum eight characters in length, including a, including a digit and an alphabet, and then click on sign up. Okay, so the system will ask you to enter an organization name. You can, uh, you can type anything like AK, AI org, or recommendation org, or whatever you please and then click on create new organization. So this will contain your organization where you can train your machine learning models. Now let's create project. So whenever we create a project, we have to select a use case that is provided on this platform. So for today's demo, we will be using two, solution, uh, two use cases. One is personalized recommendation and one is one of the forecasting solutions. So for this part, we'll use personalized recommendation use case. 
select this, click on continue. Now we the system would require a project name, type movie, recommender system or anything like that. And then I'll click on finish. So our project is created. So the second task now is to upload our data into this project. Okay. So let's start by uploading all these three data sets. So I showed you the collab notebook. These were the three data sets, user movie ratings, user ratings, user attributes, and then movie attributes. So here, the use case has a specific schema that it demands or a specific template that it encapsulates. So these are the three data sets that it is recommending us to use out of which one is absolutely required. So this one is the one that is absolutely required because if we don't have historical data on how the user and the items are interacting, then we can't really achieve any representational learning or train any new neural network, right? So let's start by uploading this one, create new, typing a name for the data set. Um, let me increase the font a bit more. Name is user movie rating. Okay, this is the data set type that we selected. Now we'll continue. Okay, so you might have some CSV file or some other format, some file in, some data set file in other format. So you can just drag it here and drop it here. And then that way you would be able to upload it in case you have your own data someday. But for the purpose of this demo, we would be using that bucket that I showed you, the AWS S3 bucket. So here you're gonna type the address copying from here. So I copied it paste it, user movie ratings. That is what you need to bring in because this one was the interactions data set, user item interactions. So this is what we need here, using user movie ratings.csv. Add data set. So this will be, so this will be inspected by the system now. That means the system is checking if the CSV is clean, if there's nothing wrong with it, then the system will populate our interfaces with the data. Now let's bring in the second one, create new, the same process. So catalog attributes. So here in this specific case, we have movies as in our catalog. So let's type movies, movie attribute. So this data set will have the attributes of the movies, like what is the genre of the movies what is the length of the movies or whatever is there in the movie lens data set. Again, clicking on this tab, entering the location here from the collab notebook. So that was a catalog, so the movie attributes. So this is the one that we are gonna select. Copy it, move back, paste the cloud location, and then add data set again. Okay. So it started inspecting this as well. Now the user attributes. So we might have some users with some history or maybe some other attributes. So we will see in the data exploration phase, what were the attributes in this data set? For now, let's just create this data set. Create new user attributes. Continue, bring in user attributes. Okay, everything looks fine. Adding this data set. Okay, now all the three, this is uploaded, the required one and the two additional one, ones, but the recommended ones are being inspected again. Let's click here. So this whole interface is divided into these four steps, data pipeline, 
schema mapping, training the model, and then finally, hold on a sec, let me pull this here. Okay, and the finally deploying the model and getting predictions, generating predictions from the deployed model. Okay, so once all these are inspected, we would be confirming the schema. So schema confirmation is nothing but making sure that we have all the required co columns to, uh, to successfully train our model. So for this user movie ratings, we required this item ID and user ID. So for every movie, there's a specific movie ID. For every user, there's a specific user ID that distinguishes them respectively from other movies and users. And then there's a timestamp where the user has interacted with this movie, maybe given a rating to this movie at some point of time. Okay, so two are uploaded, just one more to go. If I click on confirm schema mapping, it will ask me all these things. Item IDs, movie ID, okay. Confirm, user ID, user ID. Confirm, timestamp is timestamp column. Okay, so these were the columns in our data set. Confirm and continue. So our schemas, mappings are populated here. We can go back to the initial interface by clicking here. So I'm waiting for this to get inspected so that we could be good to go. So you see this has, this button has been activated because the requirements have already been fulfilled. So this is an additional thing. So that's why the system is allowing you to train model even when this is not there. Okay, now since this is populated, it's again asking you to confirm these mappings. So I'll click on resolve. So this is the item ID, which is movie ID, continue. Okay, item ID is movie ID. So something is missing. That's why it's saying user ID is missing. Okay, let's see what is missing. So if we click on data sets, you can see there's movie attribute, there's user movie ratings, there are user attributes, right? So everything, user and user, catalog and movie, user item and user movie. So everything looks correct. Let's see why it's doing this. To our internal fails free resolve. So user ID, it's not mapping. Okay, why is it doing so? Let me check. So user, okay. So user ID and movie ID. Okay, so there's something wrong with this inspection. Somehow, if we see the raw data, it's movie, I see what the problem is. And user movie, if I see the schema, or the raw data, it's user ID, movie ID rating. So this is correct data set. User one, if I see raw data, I see. So the user is the movie actually, that is what is wrong. And then the movie, and if we see the raw data, it's again the movie. So these two data sets have become identical. So that's why it's creating troubles. So let's do this. Let's delete the user information since that data set is wrong. So let's fix the mappings again, user ID. So now we have everything fixed. So now go back here. You have user movie interactions, all the requirements fulfilled. You have movie attributes, movie ID fulfilled, and then you're good to go and train the model. Okay, so there's something wrong. That's why it's bringing in the movie data set for the, uh, for the user data set. And that's why the mapping were being shaky. So that's why I removed it. So for now, let's use user movie rating and movie attributes for the purpose of this, um, for the purpose of training this model. Okay, now clicking on the train model. And then there's a default name that the system gives. You can change the name if you want. You can write like movie recommendation model. And then just simply click on train model. And now 
this training process will take a few hours because internally, as we saw, like there's a lot of machinery that goes on in training this model, hyperparameter tweaking, tweaking, then optimization, then auto ML does its thing. And then finally you get a model. So for the purpose of demo, I've already trained one project. Let me straight go to that and then explain the rest of the things. Okay, so I'll go here. Okay, so this is the same movie recommender that I've trained. And somehow here, this was correctly populated. So that's why it identified user ID as well. So this is the model that got trained, as you can see here, trained at this time, this date. You can go here. It will give you options to deploy the model. But let's first look at the metrics. Click here. So this is the set of met metrics that we saw in those slides. So now let's discuss quickly how good our model, our trained model is so that you can understand uh, exactly how to evaluate a recommendation system. Okay, so this is NDCG and this is MAP. These are two of the major metrics that are used to get an idea of the quality of predictions or the quality of recommendations. So what NDCG does is a user might have some top movie that he usually watches. And then the model might predict a set of movies that the user is likely to watch. So this NDCG metric is all based on a comparative, comparative analysis of how those two lists match up. So if they really match up, then NDCG boosts up. And if they don't, then the scores of NDCG are low. So there's a specific mathematical form that N NDCG has based on which it produces this score. So you can dig deeper into NDCG by visiting this link if you really want to get into the math of it. But on a high level, this is what exactly, this is what the principle of NDCG is based on. Same with, so five is like, it just takes into account top five instead of taking a huge list of recommendations. In 10, it takes the top 10 recommendations for a user. Second one is map. It does almost the same thing, but then there's a different mathematical form such that it penalizes for the wrong recommendations. So whenever there's an incorrect guess, there's a penalty that, as, that is associated with that guess. So that's what map does. Five at, at five and at 10 again, top five and then for this top 10 are taken. And then this is MRR, mean reciprocal, reciprocal rank. rank. So what MRR does is a lot of times what we are interested into is only top few items, like top one or two items. So for that purpose, in those cases, MRR comes into play. So what it does is it sees whether those top places are put correct or not. So if not, then it heavily penalizes. And if they're correct, then it gives a high score. Oh, I'm keep the game disappeared. Let let me message. Okay, I think I'm back. Sorry for this trouble. I'm not sure what is happening with my camera today. Can you guys hear me, Yuri? Yes. Okay, so I was at personalization. So for each user, if the model is personalizing the recommended movies or not. Like are the movies recommended for one user different from the other users or not? So that is the basic principle of this metric personalization. At 10 means it just takes into consideration the top 10 in the list of recommendations. Item coverage. So that's another interesting one where you would be able to see how well from the catalog of movies your uh, your model is producing results. Like what is the coverage? Like how many movies from the catalog of the entire movie set does it cover? So coverage should generally be high. So there's an entire blog post that I've written. 
So I'll share the link at the end. Like it's in the slides that I've already shared with you in the collab. So there is a in-depth description of how to read that these metrics if you're more interested in understanding them deeply. So I think now the, the idea, the, the broad idea and the principles for each of these individual metrics are clear. So we can analyze these scores. So 0.32, 0.23, these are actually quite good scores. Looking at this coverage level. So almost like half of the movie catalog is covered. And then also it gives these kind of NDCG and these kind of map scores. So it's, it's kind of cool. So this is actually a good model. We can conclude. And then we can create a deployment. That means now that we have successfully trained this model, we can actually um, uh, we can actually deploy it in some serving environment where it would be uh, generating re uh, results on the test set that we discussed. So we can keep it at five for now. And then in like a couple of minutes, you would see the prediction dash being populated, which means it will show you the predictions on the test set. This is the prediction API. This will also get activated once the deployment is finished. So prediction API is, is something where, uh, something using which you would be able to connect your existing applications, be it web applications or desktop applications and embed your model results into it. So this comes in very handy. You can use curl as well as Python for this. Batch predictions, if you want a lot of predictions at one go, then you can batch them together like maybe 20, maybe 1,000, depending upon your use case. So it's still doing its job. Uh, yeah, while it's deploying, we can probably answer a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. Live. So one, one question was regarding, uh, yeah, again, modeling dropout versus batch normalization, overfitting. Yeah, I would like to answer that actually. So. I wouldn't consider batch normalization uh, as a tool for uh, combating overfitting. Yeah, it has a little bit of regularization effect, but in general, its purpose is very different. Uh, the purpose is basically to uh, stabilize uh, activations between layers and simplify the job, the job of the uh, optimizer, basically. <clears throat> yeah, to simplify the job of the optimizer. For the dropout, uh, yeah, you'll basically have to just uh, use a few uh, different values and then evaluate on the validation set whatever works better. Uh, dropout is uh, actually an, an interesting uh, way of regularizing neural networks. Uh, it seems weird at first that you would just drop uh, neurons randomly uh, and hope that it would help somehow, but um, people were actually uh, were actually suggesting the hypothesis that uh, you know dro dropout is a way of doing an, uh, a kind of uh, ensemble learning where uh, by dropping different uh, neurons uh, you're basically generating different models and at the end of the day you you have an ensemble of some sort. Uh, I generally usually find uh, that uh, it's more noisy than say. L2 regularization, but it might produce uh, more interesting results. So, how's our deployment? I <laughs> definitely got a point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's continue with the deployment. <laughs> so, this is the prediction dashboard that now got populated. So, this is the user ID. You can find one if you know what you want and then you can have all these histories here and then the predictions that the trained model generated and then with both these in front of the eyes if in front of your eyes you can actually make a sense build an intuition on whether all this prediction makes sense for this user or not and then you can check for a variety of users and they might be very different from each other like somebody might like action movies somebody might like classical 80s classic or something. So you could see like what they actually watched and then what is the system suggesting for them to watch now. So that's how you can get another, uh, you can build more intuition on 
the quality of prediction using this prediction dashboard. Okay. See, it's also populating the user data so that you can have even more context. Like if, if what, like depending upon the gender, depending upon the occupation, what they were watching and then what the system is suggesting, right? Even the demographics might play in some role. So having all this in front of your eyes actually is quite good at, is quite uh, necessary for building a good intuition on the quality of model. So that's why we designed our prediction dashboard uh, for making it so intuitive, for making the for tips for making the quality of the model more obvious and intuitive. This is a prediction API that I was talking about, Python and Coral Plane. And if you run this, you need to authenticate using a new token, which instantaneously gets done. And then these are the movie IDs for this specific user that the system is uh, giving you. And then that's what you, these results you can embed in your applications. Okay, I think that's it for the demo. One of the person here asked about the metrics. So I've already discussed the principles. So if you wanna really dive deeper, definitely consider going to the blog here and reading on the evaluation. So for the recommendation system, it's part three. And then here you would be able to get a deeper idea on the mathematical form and what distinguishes these metrics from each other. Even you can click here, visit this link and it will give you useful articles that are available regarding these metrics and their mathematical forms and how, and you would be able to understand how they're distinguished from each other, how their principles look same, but still there's a lot of, there, there are significant differences. Okay, so with that I'll Hand over to hand it over to Yuri, and we'll see each other again during the Q and A session at the end. Thank you guys for staying with me and answering interesting and asking interesting questions. Hey, hello everyone! I'll share my my video also. Uh, yeah, so let's. Uh, yeah, we we, we actually. Uh, in, in terms of time, let's let's probably uh, dive into our another application forecasting, which I will be covering, and then uh, uh, Ankit will will continue answering questions uh, just in text, and then we'll have a Q and A in in the end. Uh, okay, let me share my screen. Oops. Okay, so. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> one second, just hide hide some stuff that is not necessary for me. Uh, okay, so let's start. So yeah, hello again. Uh, my name is Yuri. I am a machine learning research engineer at Abacus. And my main focus is actually our forecast in use case. I am mostly working on the core components of our modeling and uh, also I'm helping our backend engineers and also our front end engineers to integrate this into, into our product. Um, uh, second, let me, let me just... Uh, yeah, let me present it. Okay. So forecasting, uh, forecasting is actually, it turns out quite a complicated problem. And it's uh, in some sense, non-traditional non uh, application of deep learning. I will explain that later. But basically the main idea is that uh, you provide us with time series and time series is a, a a data that is actually grouped by, uh, by by some time time steps, so you should be considering uh, some sort of time series analysis if you believe that actually your data can be uh, uh, represented as time series, and you think that this uh, sequential representation actually has some advantage and there is some information. Uh, 
that is hidden uh, in, inside of, of such, such structure. So in forecasting, what we're trying to do is based on past observations, we're trying to predict uh, what will uh, the future values look like. So it's not tra non-traditional uh, for deep learning in the sense that uh, if, we're, if we were doing, for example, a time series regression where we, we were trying like to fill in some middle values, then uh, this would be a good application of deep learning because like actually like in, in many cases, all of this machine, machine learning methods, not only deep learning, they, they have like theoretical guarantees for uh, problems of interpolation. But for forecasting, what we're trying to do is basically extrapolate time series uh, uh, out, outside of the uh, <clears throat> outside of the uh, things that we, we saw in the tra training set. So uh, uh, in <clears throat> uh, that, that's that's why this this uh, use case is actually challenging not not only for deep learning but in in general for uh, many other methods, including also more traditional statistical methods. Uh, but uh, let, let me discuss uh, a little bit more uh, about what, what we're doing behind the scenes. Uh, let's assume that we actually have some sort of time series with, uh, just for the sake of the example, with 15 um, time steps. Another thing that is uh, different from other uh, applications is that uh, uh, in in time series forecasting, um, you 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 have a degree of freedom of how how would you actually split uh, your time series into samples that you would actually be feeding into your model. Uh, <clears throat> for example, in Image classification problems. Uh, this 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 uh, this task is uh, is usually very easy. Like you have images, you have some classes. Uh, well, you have some labels that were provided somehow, and then all you need to do is just ran randomly assign uh, Im images like to different uh, uh, to different uh, uh, sets, training, validation, and test set. And well, you, you'll, you'll need to make sure that uh, you know, distribution is the same across all of them so that you could compare. Uh, but uh, the difficulty in, in forecasting comes that, uh, yeah, there is, uh, there is not, not such a, a straight solution. So by default, if, if, you don't do, uh, if you don't specify anything, we will be using what we call a, a time-based split. Basically, we will allocate 10% um, uh, of the time at, at the end of the time series for test, another 10% for validation, and the rest, the rest for the training set. Uh, at this moment, we're actually not exposing validation set to the user. This is something uh, for us internally to use for our auto ML. But uh, you can control at least uh, the uh, the split into the train val and test uh, using some of the parameters that will that are available to you in the UI. Uh, like you can just specify either uh, the percentage that you would like to use for for the test or what date would you like your test to start. You can also specify uh, uh, what should be your uh, training window. Uh, but we also support uh, another kind of split where if, if, for example, in your data set, like you have a lot of different items, say you wanna uh, forecast what will be the demand for different products, then uh, in some cases, uh, uh, especially for, for the cases of shorter time series, uh, it might be advantageous actually to keep as many time steps as possible. Uh, and what we will do is basically split uh, training and test based on the products. So for some products, we will use like the whole time series for, uh, for doing uh, training. And for the others, we will use the whole uh, time series for, uh, for doing test. This is especially, we, we found that this could be especially useful uh, on recent data. Uh, so we found that uh, COVID has changed a lot of patterns 
and uh, if if we train a model that 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 hasn't seen uh, any uh, any data uh, recorded during COVID period, then it it might have it, you know the, the performance might might suffer. So by doing this trick of basically expo exposing the model on some products uh, to COVID period, we were able to significantly increase the performance overall. Uh, and because the model um, could learn something uh, from from the COVID period. So yeah, I've already mentioned to you that uh, in the end of the day, we'll need to generate samples that will actually go into uh, into our model, into our neural network. So what we'll, what we're actually doing, we're taking this time series and then slicing them uh, into different samples. And uh, basically, uh, like give, given this time series, here is a, an example of, of a sample. Basically, what, what we'll do is take some portion of time series and treat it as an input, uh, say, and you, you can control this, the size of this input uh, uh, with, a, with a parameter in our UI. But we're also trying to automatically determine what, what's, uh, what is the useful uh, in, input size. If you're putting too much input, you might be providing like too much noise to your model and it, it might struggle to um uh, learn proper patterns or if you're providing too little uh, history then yeah there is nothing to learn from then then we're also uh yeah of course there is there is an output you can control the size of the uh, output also with our parameter we call it uh, prediction step size uh another thing is we basically slide this window uh of, so we we're, we're trying to generate as many samples as possible, but not more. Let me explain a little bit uh, behind that. So uh, basically, if we try to uh, generate all possible uh, samples, uh, uh, then there will be a lot of samples that are overlapping. And uh, uh, there is not much use to it because it will be like repeat repeated information. So what we found is uh, being useful is that to control actually how, how much uh, we allow our samples to overlap. And there is also a parameter in our, uh, in our UI that you can customize, but we also have like some internal heuristics and, and tests that are trying to determine it. Uh, in the end of the day, what we end up doing is uh, we try to we, we actually generate all possible samples just with uh, with the rolling window by uh, uh, moving moving these windows by one, and then uh, we randomly select uh, some amount of samples, and this amount uh, is determined on the calculation of how many samples are actually allowed allowed to overlap. Like in general, we found this uh, to be uh, to to work better than even just to. Uh, sequentially um, gen generate samples that's, uh, that have just a fixed overlap. So for our test um, samples, there is a, li a little bit of, of differences that uh, uh, in our UI, we allow, uh, also, we also have a, a, an additional parameter which we call prediction lengths. And this is, uh, slightly different from the prediction step size in the sense that we, <clears throat> we allow prediction size to be bigger than the prediction step size. So prediction step size is something that model internally uh, is, is the size of the output of the neural network itself. And then what we're doing is that we're, we're using uh, neural network predictions to, uh, uh, to predict some, to, to predict further uh, time steps uh, to fill in uh, the whole prediction length. Uh, you might heard of it as something like a teacher uh, teacher enforcing. Uh, it's it sounds weird at first, but after some experimentation, we actually found that it's uh, like this kind of scheme, especially when the prediction length is not that much bigger than the prediction step size. It could be uh, advantageous uh, because. Uh, by allowing smaller prediction step size, we can generate more training samples. So we can have actually more, more data for our model to learn from. But you know, this is, this is a balance and something that 
uh, you can experiment with, and uh, you know, the, we definitely saw cases where, uh, especially for a long prediction length, it's uh, still better to just uh, pick prediction step size the same as the prediction length, so that the model can actually also learn what what should uh, the structure, what should what should be the general shape uh, be. Uh, uh, another thing is that we're actually before um, uh, before uh, before feeding time series into a neural network, uh, it is it is actually very important to do some sort of scaling so that, uh, uh, especially in deep in deep learning, uh, all of your data uh, should be scaled. It, it it's uh, in general it works better when. Uh, <clears throat> there is not much variation between samples in terms of like mean, mean, uh, mean, mean and variance. Uh, 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 and, uh, and another aspect of time series, like if you, if you're actually coming from, uh, if you had, if you had some uh, experience with time series analysis, uh, there, there is a lot of usually discussion in the traditional methods on uh, ways of transforming time series so that uh, we move to uh, uh, we, we restore stationarity as much as possible. So this is something that we're also looking into and currently it's actually under development, but we do have a few tricks internally to try to actually stationarize time series. We yeah we, we just expose them through 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 scale, scaling in the UI but what basically happens, we have a few different uh, schemes on, on how to perform it, uh, either to uh, scale the whole time series uh, with, with uh, values that are co computed on like the whole train uh, set, or we can, we can be doing also sliding scaling. Uh, well, actually our, our AutoML internally tries to uh, determine like what is the best thing and we're, we're using just our validation error to uh, uh, to pick uh, the best possible uh, scheme. One thing that you can control is uh, uh, for scaling uh, one parameter that we expose in our UI is like um, max scale context, uh, we, which ba basically tells us uh, how, how many uh, previous steps to consider uh, in our scaling pattern. By default, we're, we're using the full history length, but in some cases we're actually found it is advantageous to look at a smaller number of steps. Uh, so uh, internally, our neural network is currently based, uh, the core is uh, recurrent neural network, and we're actually using so-called LSTM layers, long short, short, long short term memory uh, units. So basically the way uh, RNN, I'll just give you a brief overview how, how our RNN works. It processes uh, time steps uh, in sequence, one, one at a time. And uh, so it, it, takes, uh, it takes an input, uh, passes through uh, a few layers, produces, uh, produces some output. But we're also, when we're moving to the next step, we're reusing the activations uh, of uh, a neural network of, of uh, neurons from the previous step. So we pass them as, as, as an input. And uh, we repeat this process to basically uh, cover the whole uh, time series that we have. And uh, in, uh, uh, in LSTM units, we uh, introduce additional gates that uh, basically control uh, uh, control the stream of information uh, that would uh, allow how much uh, information to use like from previous activations and how much to use like from, from, from current input. Uh, in addition to that, on top of RNNs, uh, we're, we're also using convolutional layers. Uh, but since we have this uh, uh, time series structure, we need to be very careful uh, to uh, uh, preserve causality. Basically, like our current uh, predictions should be based only on the past values. It shouldn't, uh, uh, it shouldn't rely in, in any way on the future that that would be leaking. And that's why we're using so-called causal convolutional layers that basically to produce 
current output, uh, it performs convolutions only on pre previous time steps. In many cases, we actually found that uh, uh, convolutional layers can boost the performance significantly in conjunctions with RNN and even in some data sets, uh, pure CNNs uh, worked perfectly fine. And the advantage of CNNs is that they, they are actually much faster than, than LSTMs. Uh, you can control actually all of this. Well, we would we'll try and in the, if you provide us with the data set and hit the train button, we will try to find uh, the best uh, best combination of hyperparameters like number of CNN layers, uh, number of CNN filters, number of uh, recurrent layers, and etc. But you can also control these parameters uh, in in our UI uh, if you're curious to see like how how it affects performance. So other options that we have is uh, uh, that, that you can control, like one of the cool features is uh, yeah, our da data augmentation. Basically, if you click on this button, uh, we will train a generative adversarial network uh, to generate sy synthetic time series. It's uh, usually it's uh, not that useful for uh, big data sets. They have a lot of data already, but for Small data sets, we found that this, this could actually uh, boost uh, the performance of the uh, final model that, that we ship. Another thing that you can uh, control, of course, uh, like if your data set has a lot of zeros and or, you're, and or uh, you're, it's actually very important for you to predict zeros uh, uh, accurately, uh, we can include uh, a sub network that is basically just a classifier uh, that that tells tells you whether um, a prediction should be zero or or something else. So uh, basically, uh, what this sub network will do it will like uh, make a prediction for some time step with some confidence whether it should be zero or not, and then internally. If, if this confidence exceeds some threshold, we will just uh, forcefully put zero regardless of what uh, our uh, RNN on CNN produced. Uh, yeah, you can also, there are some flags that can, uh, that uh, Ampit already, already covered, like you can control batch size, like initial learning rates. This is something that we will use as, a, as, a, as an initial step, but then our AutoML will uh, actually tweak it. Uh, you can also, uh, forcefully enable or disable uh, batch normalization. And uh, yeah, you can uh, also tweak uh, dropout or L L2 uh, regularization in, in our uh, forecasting network. So let's, let's actually do some, uh, some action with forecasting. I, we prepared a, a data set. This is actually a pub public data set that's uh, I like it because it's it's, it's good for uh, demonstrations. It's not 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 a big data set, but it has some of the quirks of uh, uh, of, of forecasting. So the public data set is basically uh, yeah, it was a Kaggle comp competition a few years ago, and the problem was given uh, a historic TV sales, uh, try to forecast uh, uh, what what will be the sales for. Um, uh, what will be the sales for like different TVs in the future. So uh, what you'll need to do is basically in uh, our, uh, uh, yeah, so in, in, in this notebook, hopefully like everyone got, got the link from the uh, recommendation demo. What you'll need to do is just copy and paste, uh, sorry, we copy and paste the link to the data set. We already uploaded it into our uh, AWS bucket. Uh, let's just go ahead and do that. And then what we'll do is, uh, yeah, I've already prepared a project, but uh, let's create actually a new, a new project uh, for this specific uh, problem. I will, I will wa walk you through. So we want we want to basically uh, these are, these are different our different use cases, and basically we have uh, four use cases for forecasting. In this case, what we want to do is forecast sales. So let's let's select uh, this uh, this application. 
then continue. Let's uh, let's call this uh, some let's call this project something meaningful like TV sales project. And then what we'll do, we will upload our data set. Uh, yeah, you can either download the data set and then upload uh, by yourself, uh, or we can just use uh, our AWS buckets and we will uh, uh, we will pick it up automatically. So let's call this data set like historical TV sales. And uh, yeah, and let, let's just import it from, yeah, you, as I said, you can either upload the data set in different formats by yourself, or we can just uh, copy and paste the link uh, to our AWS bucket. Then we click on add data set, and then, uh, then our platform will perform some inspection. It will double check that data set makes sense. Uh, it will try to, uh, convert it into a format that is uh, usable for, for our ne next steps internally. Uh, let's see if there are questions while it's doing inspection. Yeah, there are, uh, yeah, a good question about the spike. Um, yeah, so, you know, it de depends on the kind of spike. If, it, if it's just a ra random huge spike, uh, yeah, it's, uh, in general, it's unforecastable. You, you cannot do much. Okay, so our model, uh, our data set has been in inspected. So now the next step, what, what we'll do is just to confirm schema. Schema is just a mapping uh, between uh, the columns uh, between our internal co columns and what, what we have in the data set. Uh, so inspection step that just uses some heuristics to try to infer like what columns uh, should be used, how should they be used. But in this case, yeah, like this sales agent ID, it's basically an item ID or a product ID. Uh, so sales is the amount of sales. So this is just, you know, the count. So yeah, we inferred correctly. And then the date, yeah, date, pretty, pretty simple. Uh, you can do some basic things as, uh, you know, see some uh, simple statistics uh, uh, about, about the data set. You can also click on the, and explore uh, what kind of time series you have in your, in, in your data sets and also see your raw data. By the way, we allow two kinds of data sets to be uh, uploaded. One, one is the historical sales or actually the, the data set that, that contains time series, but another one uh, we allow also to upload item attributes. So this one is not time series data, but rather uh, some additional values that are specific to uh, each item or, or product like Say in this case, uh, yeah, we, we were not providing it, but since we're talking for about uh, uh, TVs, then this additional item attributes could be some characteristics of, uh, of, of, a, of a TV set, like, you know, uh, inches uh, or like type, type of the display, maybe, maybe price, uh, like what, whatever you think is useful. Uh, yeah, we could also, and, and is useful and is, um, something that that could help the network to learn better models uh could definitely be uploaded like in this in this data set but if you also have a, a some additional time series data uh you can include it um, in your original time series data set and you know our, our model is actually able also to incorporate uh additional time series features so now it's time basically to train different models and as a first step um <clears throat> I would say for this data set, uh, you know, it's provided as a daily uh, data set, but uh, this is uh, this is a very it's, it's quite high frequency, and probably we're not really interested in uh, predicting sales like on every particular day. It's more like uh, we we want to 
make make prediction for some considerable future. So it's it makes sense to uh, use a higher frequency to sort of also hide uh, some uh, uh, high frequency noise. Uh, but you know this is this is something that that you should uh, also experiment with. Like if you're interested, for example, in monthly forecast and you want to make like one quarter predictions like three months uh, in advance. Then what we found is that for some data sets, actually just rolling everything into monthly and making prediction works fine. Uh, but if you do that, you sort of lose uh, like of some fine structure, uh, like a high, high frequency component. So sometimes to make a good, uh, say quarterly predictions, it might make sense actually to make your forecast weekly and predict like 13 weeks in advance. So in this particular demo, let's just stick to weekly and then let's just predict seven uh, uh, seven weeks in advance and that's uh, that's basically if you if you're not uh, if you just want to have some model that's that's all you need to do so then uh, internally we will try to do our best in determining like different hyperparameters I was talking about to uh, pick the best model that is available to you one of the um, one of the interesting features that we also have is, uh, you know, our, our forecast uh, will provide, will, if, if you want, we can also provide you with probability quantiles and internally we're doing quantile regression to um, provide like confidence intervals. Uh, and in sales forecasting, it could be actually quite important. Like, you know, noise is uh, in general in, in forecasting applications, noise is unavoidable. So we'll uh, we'll need we'll need something to quantify it, and we'll need to take into account uh, uh, like if you're if you're doing some planning based based on the forecast, uh, you might be interested also in uh, seeing like uh, <clears throat> at what confidence level uh, you want to use uh, your forecast to like basically like create a stock for example. Uh, okay, let's let's train a model. And since we're doing auto ML and we were basically in the background, we're training a lot of models, it will take a, a lot of time. Well, in this particular case, it's not a big data set. So it'll probably take like between 30 minutes to an hour, but certainly uh, outside of the uh, outside of the time of this uh, workshop, unfortunately. But we can explore uh, different options uh, that, that we expose in our UI. Yeah, let's let's again switch to weekly, and then if you click on the advanced, uh, so there are a bunch of options that uh, I was covering in my presentation. Uh, yeah, the simplest one, yeah, you can control like the test split. You can choose a test start, test test start. Some of the things that uh, that control uh, the neural network. Also, you can switch to. Uh, instead of doing time-based split you can uh, do item-based splits uh, another column uh, that we also have here actually right now we're actively uh, experimenting with uh, also including or generating some additional columns uh, from the time series that, that, that you provide like uh, <clears throat> like maybe uh, trying to uh, 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 like one, one of the approaches that we tested, for example, is like try to uh, extract like a principal components and maybe try to focus them or just uh, include them as, as, as an additional information. Uh, uh, but, you know, at, at this at this stage is uh, it's more uh, experiments, but we will actually put them uh, uh, soon back into our product as of now what we still found useful in many cases is even just computing um, the sum of all products uh, can still be in, uh, informative and useful for making uh, forecast so you can you can also just select this uh, uh, yeah you can also uh, do data augmentation and also if you don't want us to try to scale uh, or transform time series, uh, you can like click on this parameter here. Uh, in some cases, actually we found that uh, if we just using pure convolutional uh, neural network, 
it, it is able actually to pick up uh, these transformations on its own. So we don't we don't even need to worry about how to scale or stationarize time series. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, you can create different kinds of models and you can then um, try to assess the influence of these parameters. Uh, if you're if you're more data science savvy and if you know more about uh, uh, neural networks, but we're 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 again we're trying to do our best uh, uh, so that you you actually don't don't need to do that. But if you're curious, uh, you can uh, explore these options. Uh, so let me actually go back to uh, the project that uh, I have prepared. So basically, uh, <clears throat> before this workshop, I trained uh, different models, uh, basically just varying some of the things by by myself manually. So I have uh, so this this is our uh, baseline model. Then I tweaked, for example, how much history we allow into our network uh, or how much we have in like an overlap or I change test start also like this uh, there is one model that I created uh, that should be yeah I don't see it here anyway that, that doesn't doesn't that much matter so basically if you if you use uh, yeah if you use control these parameters manually, then you might see some variation uh, in the accuracy of your forecast. I will explain in, in a minute like what, what we mean by accuracy. Um, but you know, here actually we see that, yeah, there is, there is some variation, especially, especially like for this model, yeah, the accuracy dropped. But since even, even when you specify these parameters, we are, we are still incorporating some, uh, exploration in, in our AutoML. So even if you select something wrong, uh, there, there might be a case uh, that's uh, by controlling some other hyperparameters, AutoML is able actually to uh, straighten things uh, to, 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 fix, uh, to fix problems. Let's actually click on some of the models. So accuracy is something that that we just wanted to have uh, like a, like a single number uh, that basically tells you gives you a notion like gives you a notion uh, of uh, how good the model is. Uh, so it's a number between zero and a hundred percent, and internally, like for small errors, you can uh, treat it as uh, actually like the like one minus accuracy would be like your percentage error. Uh, but for higher errors, of course, like, uh, yeah, there will be, a, uh, <clears throat> it will be a little bit harder to interpret for, uh, for you guys who are like more uh, data science savvy, basically accuracy is uh, one minus uh, symmetric mean average percentage error over two. Uh, SMAPE short. So SMAPE is, is a metric that, that is bounded between zero and 200%. Uh, and uh, could be used like to measure like how, how good your model is. We also, you'll see like some bar plots where we basically like take all of your items and uh, split them into quartiles. Uh, like on the left, uh, this is uh, the quartile with best items. Like you can see like, uh, yeah, like for many, for like 25% of items, our accuracy is actually pretty good. Uh, there are two bars here. One is uh, point-wise accuracy. The one, the other one, which is called like a C accuracy. This one is an accuracy of, uh, of, of sums. So like in the prediction length window, some of our clients were basically interested. They were not that much interested in uh, being spot on in forecasts, like for like say every month or every week, but they were more interested in uh, making good forecasts like for the whole um, uh, quarter. So this, this, this metric basically just computes uh, the sums and compares them predicted values with, with the actual ones. This, uh, this bar plot is a, uh, uh, is a breakdown by actually volume of items. So in many cases, uh, so the, the purpose of this is basically to um, try to separate items uh, that have a lot of data from items that have 
that don't have that that much uh, data. Um, so you, if 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 a product wasn't selling that much or like not not in many quantities, like uh, if your your data set like will be sorry type series for it will be like close to zero and spiky, like you you couldn't really like focus much. There is not much information from it. So this bar plot basically tells you like how. Uh, like what what is uh, the breakdown of performance based like on uh, on on volume of of an item, and actually this weighted accuracy is is a is a measure uh, of like how much volume actually is a measure of like importance of volume. So basically accuracy here this this we compute accuracy on uh, as an average of on all items, but weighted accuracy we use basically volume of, of of an item uh, as a uh, uh, as a weighting factor uh, of how to combine accuracies of uh, on different items into one number. Uh, uh, so if you're more uh, again data science savvy or like a little or if you're a little bit familiar with time series analysis, we actually provide like more metrics here and more, more traditional ones like uh, weighted absolute percentage error or RMSE uh, normal uh, root mean square error. But actually here we're providing normalized because uh, we want to see like, uh, you know, different items could have different scales, internal scales. And we're, we're trying to uh, find like one number, one good measure like between different products. Uh, you can also, again, uh, mod models are of course deployable, and uh, yeah, you can explore. Uh, yeah, let's 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 just uh, deploy some model, and I can talk about uh, visualization. Something went wrong with this. Let's just redeploy this model. And why deployment is in progress? Let's see what kind of questions we have. Yeah, someone asked again about zeros. So in, in some cases, uh, yeah, if if uh, if you yeah again like if you're if in your use case it's actually very important to predict zero for some reason, uh, then we include like additional subnetwork that, that that is just a classifier. So basic basically this it it works in conjunction with with an RNN. Uh, it's basically be, be, it's becoming like a multitask learning. We're we're both like doing a training on uh, uh, on time series and and then also on on the classification task zero or not zero. So this classifier will try to like uh, uh, give uh, give a number between zero and one, which we interpret as some some sort of a confidence. And uh, yeah, if if this confidence uh, is like higher than some threshold, then we just override the prediction of, of RNN with zero. Uh, okay, let's explore uh, the deployment visualization. So basically, yeah, this is why I like this example, this data set, because we, yeah, it's a, it's a real real life example and there are some spikes and then there is there is actually like definitely some non-stationarity. Uh, but uh, so here the orange line is basically a split, uh, you know, this this is a trained portion of time series that we used and then the blue one is is our test. And the green one is the is is the prediction into the future. So like outside of our data set, if we want to assess uh, the, if you want to visually assess the quality of the model, you can basically uh, just uh, uh, shift your prediction window on top of the test. And in this particular item, uh, we did we did a pretty good job overall um, of. Uh, making a prediction in our test window. 
So you can either uh, uh, do it by hand in our UI, or you can also just uh, pick what should be the prediction start. Uh, like say we want to start it on May on on yeah June June fifth. Uh, yeah, we we just we just selected here. So uh, yeah, here we're also uh, giving you the choice of products, and we. Um, we sort them by uh, by our ac accuracy measure here, so we can select something that that looks like uh, worse than the previous. And yeah, we can definitely see that actually like this this focus is uh, is sorry is is more off than than the previous one. But also in this case, uh, you know, spikes are much higher and like the, the overall volume is lower. And uh, in some cases, we couldn't like make a, a usable forecast at all. But this is because like this item doesn't have any data at all. Uh, or this one, uh, actually, yeah, this one it's not forecastable. Like training periods has on, have only zeros, and then there is just one spike in test. So uh, I would say that uh, that actually concludes this part of presentation. So in this workshop, uh, we gave you a brief overview of some fundamentals of deep learning and, and applications to uh, recommender systems and, and forecasting. And we also uh, provided you with a demo and hopefully you, you were also able to train your own uh, models. And uh, if, you, if you were in interested, you could also try and tweak in our parameters. Uh, so if you're, if you're really, uh, yeah, we will have a Q&A session right now and try to answer all of your questions. Uh, we have like different resources that you could explore on our website and on our blog. And feel free if you have, uh, if you wanted to get in touch with us or if you have uh, questions, uh, feel free to reach either me or Ankit and we will be very happy actually to answer you or connect you with uh, more people in our company. So Yuri, um, there are three questions that are left for you. I think you would be a better person to answer them. Uh, okay, so let's see. Well, I've, I've already answered the question about uh, zeros. So I can just... Yeah, the spike, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the mark. Um, how to focus in case of natural calamity consistently every year. So right now we're basically, yeah, we're relying on the data to make a forecast, we're relying on the data set that you provide. So we, we, we do have an internal discussion and maybe also uh, connecting uh, our platform with some external data sets like to augment uh, whatever our customers are provide, providing if they want to. But uh, uh, yeah, in, in general, it's whatever, whatever is in your data set. So if your data set somehow uh, has an information uh, like about this natural calamities, uh, then our model should be able to pick it up. But uh, we already see like, you know, we, are, we, are, we, we have a calamity right now like this uh, COVID. And uh, for some of our customers, it didn't affect much. So our models are fine, but in, in some cases, uh, like on some online retailers, like their sales spiked this year. So uh, we need to do some extra steps in order to account for this period. Basically, like I, I was talking about, like one of the tricks that we're doing is uh, splitting um, splitting time series, not only by time, time, time steps, but also by items. Basically try to have some items in the train set some products uh, that's uh, um, that use like the whole time series as, as a training and basically this way the model will have uh, will have an access uh, to this uh, COVID period and uh, the hope is that it should be able uh, to learn something uh, about it. Uh, I'm actually not sure what it, what is interrupted TM. 
Yeah, me, me neither. I don't know what TN stands for here. Uh, for the airport, if you prefer to uh, raise your hand to you know clarify your questions, please feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you uh, to discuss uh, uh, further. And uh, we still have a few more minutes, uh, but uh, you can keep uh, posting questions and uh, we can uh, get all of your questions answered. Hi, hey, Kyron. Um, please go ahead. I unmute you. You should be able to speak. Yeah, Yuri, I just raised this question. You just answered it about yeah. the natural calamity. Yeah. Uh, we are not talking about the COVID, which, uh, which is unique and happens only in, in a, um, about 100 years of span. But a natural disaster like uh, fire, uh, uh, which happens uh, regularly in uh, places like California. Yeah. Uh, that that kind of scenario, how the prediction uh, we we can have third party data from uh, uh, the disaster um, uh, websites, isn't it? Yeah. Based on that, how to uh, include that factor into prediction of sales? That is my question. So uh, yeah. So well, yeah. You can actually. So first of all, uh, if you if you do believe that you know this factor actually affects your sales, then if you look at your time series, like you will, uh, you you should be seeing like in case of fires in California, they are periodical, so you should be seeing then some um, uh, periodicity in your data, some seasonality. So uh, even without including like any additional factors, like if it, if seasonality in the in the data, uh, our model should be able to pick it up and to make a future forecast that will actually uh, take take this into account. So in addition to, to that, uh, you can basically provide us like with an additional column, uh, probably like a time series column, uh, where. Uh, uh, like if you're considering like several different disasters, it might be like a categorical basically for every time step. Uh, you can say like what kind of uh, event is happening right now. Uh, uh, and then, uh, yeah, just train the model and see if it's actually useful or not. Yeah, in, in, in the future, I think what we will be doing is, uh, uh, yeah, there is, there is some demand for it is uh, like use, uh, Public, publicly available uh, data sets that are being generated like online uh, that actually contain this kind of information. Someone uh, did train a California wildfires model that was on our showcase for quite, a, quite some time. And then um, he used that data set from Kaggle. <clears throat> but that was under um, different use case, anomaly outlier detection kind of use case, not this forecasting one. Uh, yeah, considering that those were anomalies in that data set. But yeah, you could do a, a lot of such things, bring in interesting data sets and see some interesting underlying patterns by training models under different use cases. Um, uh, I can see there are two more uh, in the chat. Uh, one of them is, can be add extreme events in the model, and another way to ask him for share the slides. Uh, maybe you want to post, you know, the resources, you know, the code lab link. Uh, I think you posted it before, but maybe you can just copy paste to yeah. to the chat again. The the link to the code lab to the slides to yeah, so people can get it. Okay, I did that. Thank you. So um, so I searched the entire chat and found a few of the questions. I might be able to answer some of them. Let me share my screen again. <clears throat> so one was in cross-validation. Somebody was asking what exactly it is. So I explained it to an extent earlier, but I think this kind of diagram might make it more clear. So it's like something like this. There are splits. And then for each split, you rotate the validation set like this. And the rest becomes the training set. And then you tweak the hyperparameters on this validation set. And in every experiment, you keep on doing that. And finally, you take the average of all the uh, 
hyperparameters that you get get in each individual experiment, and then that's how you get the final final hyperparameters for your uh, for your final model. So this is like fivefold cross validation in this specific diagram. And somebody was asking me how this can overshoot. So you can imagine like if your learning rate is too high, that alpha that I showed you, then this gradient that you're getting, let's say it was already very high. So your learning rate being high, getting multiplied by this gradient being high, becomes a high like, large number. And that large number when added to your current random point becomes larger and then might come here and then again adding come here. So it might shoot really far. So imagine such a situation where the gradient is large and you don't minimize it by using a, a good learning rate. So that's, that's how it uh, gets. And on the other side, it might be too low and it never reaches the global optimal, optimum. So in that case also you might suffer. So you need to keep it at an optimal level. Yep, that is it. So one more thing I would like to highlight here. Um, our model showcase contest. So it's live already. So you can check out this URL. I can share in the chat as well. So this is our, our deep learning contest where people are invited to, to train their deep learning models, bring any data set that they would want to play with and then experiment with those data sets. You can also learn using our sample data sets within the system on how to use our system. And then you can bring your own data to play with the system and get some results. And then finally, what you can do is put those trained models on our showcase. So if, so Yuri already showed you the slides um, here. Let me bring it real quick. So this is our website. This is the documentation. This is the blog. I think there was no. So abacus.ai hyphen showcase, um, hyphen models. That's what is, that's what is the showcase that we have. So if you paste here, this is what you will get, which I already did. So every two weeks, we select one model to feature, and that also gets into our weekly newsletter. But for this time to do something new and promote uh, more learning, we have organized something unique, which is the model showcase contest. And now what you can do is you can, not only you can train your machine learning models, but you can share them with our community. And then on February 10th, we will announce the winners. So there will be three people who would be uh, one person who would be receiving this grand prize of thousand dollars, three second winners who would receive $300 and then the third one receiving hundred dollars. So three for the third one as well. So the contest is already on. There are some rules for this contest, which are here. So what you need to do is train models and showcase them on the showcase, which is this page. And it's quite easy to do. What you need to do is just we already saw during the demo, this was the trained model. You click on this here. This is your model. You click here on the model details page. You click here, you name it, you write a description, you choose a thumbnail, and then you share. Like X, Y, Z or whatever for now. And let's just click on share, public page. So you can see it's shared here. So it appears on the model showcase. Here, came here. So we will select one of the models, few of the models from this list of models that people share. And then that list will come out and that final list of winners will come out on 10th of February. So the contest is on, you're most welcome to experiment with the system and then put your models here. And you're also welcome to ask us any questions that you might have in this process of training and sharing your models. We would definitely be responsive and reply if you get stuck. Somebody also asked me something on AutoML. So I gave them the link of the videos relating to our AutoML workshop by Colin White. And these are a few of the slides that he used that I pulled up. This is what I mentioned, the search, the search space. 
the search strategy and then the final evaluation technique for, for selecting the top neural network architectures that works the best for that specific data set that you're using within the use case. Yep. So if you guys have any more questions, you're most welcome to ask me or Yuri. That's great. Um, uh, is anybody still have questions? Um, feel free to post in the Q&A chat or raise your hand. Um, yeah, there was a simple question from Kiran about if we can sync third party that that that. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, we. We, we don't have we're like what what we built so far are some diff different kind of connectors like to uh, your your own database uh, but if, if we, well you know it's it it, it depends like pro probably if 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 the third party data is already in your system then uh, then we can yeah so uh so I can show you that interface if that makes sense. Let me share the screen real quick again. So I already shared with somebody the answer to a similar question where I told them how we have a set of connectors and we have introduced some more recently. Like if you create a project, anything, just type anything, create a data set, create new, anything, click here. So we saw how to pull data from AWS S3 bucket. Same goes with GCP. But then besides that, we have new connectors like BigQuery. If you have a project ID within your BigQuery account, then you can just use that here. And then it will get connected and populated subsequently. Same with Salesforce and Snowflake. Yeah. So. so yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess, yeah, to answer your question, yeah, so we will pull data from these connectors, but, you know, if you're really needs, if, you, if you're thinking about, like, really something third party that you want to merge into, like, uh, data set that you have, then, no, at this moment, we don't, we don't provide this. Yeah. But, but you, you'll, you'll just have to merge it uh, manually, I guess, in your data set and then upload it to our platform. But as I, as I said previously, we, we are actually discussing it because, uh, yeah, there are valid use cases for it. Yeah. Okay, see some nice discussion, also in questions. I think that we covered all of the questions, right? Yeah. If I only have data set and not sure of what model to use is, yeah. So that's why we have divided uh, the service into a set of solutions within which you have several use cases. And each use case offers a template. For example, we use two today, a recommendation use case, personalized recommendation, and a forecasting use case, demand forecasting. So they had a fixed data set template. And then according to that template, you upload data. So you can check out all those solutions and use cases that we provide. And then that's how you would come to know the exact templates and the data set requirements under all those use cases. So you can read our documentation and get to know all that. So just go to the website and uh, there you can read a description of the solutions and the use cases being provided. And if you want to dig even deeper, then go to the documentation center. I can again show you. Just a sec, let me share. So here you have already trained your models. You can use the same interface and click here, and that will take you to the documentation center. And this is where you would be able to see which use case would be the most suitable for you by reading all this. So this will give you a good idea of all the use cases that we provide. Last question is about any real world applications of, of deep learning. And uh, yeah, so I can talk about forecasting with, with regards to this. 
So we do, we do have now real customers uh, who are uh, actually using using our platform to like make forecasts and then use use it uh, use it internally uh, in in their planning. Uh, so yeah, you know, as an alternative to deep learning and in forecasting, you know, it's uh, people were working on it for a long time, and there are uh, statistical methods. Uh, but I, I would say. Uh, in like demand forecasting, forecasting the, the standard model is probably ARIMA or SARIMA, which is like seasonal autoregressive integrated moving average. This is a statistical model that, uh, yeah, well, I would say it's like one of the simple simplest ones, uh, but nevertheless, it's uh, uh, it has some. You, you you can look at it and you know understand what it's doing, and it also explicitly explicitly incorporates uh, uh, noise components into it. Uh, however, uh, you know this is like a we can say li linear models like of, of in the in the stochastic processes space. So what the LSTM allows you to do is like uh, actually try to find uh, more nonlinear dependencies. Uh, and uh, in many cases, we, we actually saw it is outperforming it. Like one thing that is uh, neural networks are struggling, as, as I uh, mentioned to you initially in the beginning, is that, you know, in general, like this whole machine learning space is more like theoretical guarantees are for interpolation problems. So like you're basically like you're training uh, distribution and your test distribution should be should be the same. So and in, in forecasting, like if you have like some trends, uh, some seasonality, some some things, uh, when, when you're trying to extrapolate, so this this might be actually uh, violated. So in, in in these cases, we actually saw that our performance uh, degrades. But uh, what you can do is actually use the statistical methods to try to basically bring time series into the space where uh, uh, neural networks uh, basically like use a statistical model to uh, like remove trends, seasonality and etc. And then on top of it, try to use neural networks to pick up uh, additional things that uh, simple things couldn't do. So uh, yeah. Uh, No, so oh, no. I, I, so the la last question. No, RNN, CNN. Yeah, CNN can do what RNN does. No, I, I actually didn't mean it in in this way. So I, I was just uh, talking about that. Uh, for some data sets that are that do not have like some uh, very complicated structure, uh, it might be an overkill like to use an RNN. RNN is more expensive in general than than CNN in terms of computations. So uh, in some cases, it's uh, like all, all you need to do is just use uh, con convolution operations, and they're like extremely fast. But, you know, if you have something more complicated, if it like, you know, uh, uh, addition of RNN can actually like really help. So in this case, if you have like a, a combined model, CNN and RNN, like you can treat uh, convolutional layers as some sort of filters that are uh, trying to transform series into a uh, form that is more suitable for RNNs. At least that's, that's how I uh, prefer to interpret it. Yeah, it also depends on uh, the, the way you're using it. Like for like my research during masters was on image captioning. And that's where a lot of um, encoder decoder architectures use CNN as encoder for yeah. featurizing the image and then an RNN as a decoder for the language modeling. So it's at the intersection of this uh, computer vision and natural language processing. And then you use both uh, subsequently a CNN and an RNN. And uh, yeah, you, you you kind of do a lot of attention using LSTMs or other GRUs or any other form of RNN. And then you featureize using different kinds of CNN architectures. Yeah, so depends on how you want to use it, what you're going to get from CNN and what you're going to utilize the RNN for. <laughs> Uh, 
I have been learning DL, now RL and quantum are unfolding. How much time do we have to go on learning? When do we deliver? Yeah, so that's why I mentioned in the very beginning that uh, a lot of times you wanna just deliver. So you don't wanna go into the nitty gritty details of a lot of uh, engineering or a lot of machinery that goes on inside of these things. So at that time you wanna restrict yourself to the domain rather than going into the details of some other fields like deep learning or whatever you said, quantum mechanics, quantum physics, whatever. So you wanna abstract yourself and remain at that abstraction level rather than digging in. So that's where services like abacus.ai might come into handy, which would let you abstract a lot of such machinery and be at some outer level of abstraction and save your time and energy. Um, you provide sample data to demo other uses of the... Yeah, for every use case, we have a sample data set within that use case. So just click on the sample data set button whenever you make a project under any use case. And that's how you can play with that use case using the sample data. Sometimes using sorry max does not truly capture the nonlinear relationships, but deep learning does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's true. That, that's that's what I actually said. Like, if you look at the structure of uh, Sarima, uh, like at, at the, at the uh, stochastic process that, that it models, basically it's, it's it's linear. Like you know, this autoregressive terms, uh, it's 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 just a linear regression on top of them. Uh, yeah, there is this part which is integrated. Uh, so integrated that it provides, you know, some differencing. So it, uh, well, you know, it's still uh, like uh, some, some, but basically like fir first order differencing will remove like linear trends. Second order differencing hopefully will remove like uh, parabolic trends and etc. Uh, but you know, it's it's also it has a lot of like hyperparameters and. Uh, for big data sets, it might become also like very slow. Uh, and it's uh, an another advantage could be of, of deep learning is uh, like in the way we formulate it is that uh, uh, we can try to build a model that it's uh, that is actually learning on multiple time series at the same time. So it tries to find like uh, what what sort of predictors were useful for different kinds of items in your data sets. Sarima is usually, uh, yeah, you're doing one, one time series at a time, but you know, there, there is a version that sort of expands it into uh, multivariate space, but it, it becomes like much more computationally expensive. Yeah, I would say at this moment, yeah, if we don't have any more questions and in, in our forecasting, what we're trying to do, uh, we, we started initially as a, as a pure deep learning uh, approach. Now we're actually adding also uh, some uh, more traditional statistical methods, including, including Sarima. And we're currently evaluating whether even like doing something hybrid can, can be advantageous. Because we do not, we do not want to uh, discard all of the knowledge that was built in the time series analysis space in like recent decades. All right, uh, I think that's uh, uh, that's all. Um, we are twenty minutes over times. Uh, thanks a lot, both uh, Anke and uh, Yuri, for the workshop and uh, the great discussions. Thanks everyone who uh, joined us today and post a lot of uh, very good questions. I hope you have great learning. 
Um, and the setting recorded, uh, it will be on YouTube. Actually, right now it's on YouTube. Uh, I will send the link uh, for those who missed any part of that or you want to review it again, uh, you will, uh, you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, and also someone mentioned about, uh, uh, you know, the auto mail uh, workshops and also the, I mean, this is a serious uh, uh, workshops uh, working with uh, uh, epicus.ai. Uh, we have all of the uh, recordings for the previous sessions and the topics. Uh, I, you can go to the YouTube. Uh, we have the playlist uh, for all of them. Uh, you can learn, uh, you can review all of those uh, recordings. Uh, I will send the links to uh, to you guys in the follow up emails. Um, so with that, let's conclude today's event. Again, thanks everyone for joining us. Hope to see you again next event. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for participating and interesting questions. That's great. Uh, I'm going to end the meeting right now. Uh, hope to see you again next time. Bye bye.